I think that the Brick Lane Circle is really fantastic in the work that it does because it it it, it aims the the aim is it's about education and it's about involving people from all different backgrounds, different ages, different experiences, different political views, different religions, all together in moving forward in trying to understand much more about British history. Well, my history with the, with the Brick Lane Circle has been over many years. I've given seminars and lectures and, and, and discussions and so on. The Brick Lane Circle focusing on 2007 was to raise awareness amongst all of the local populations to really see the links, the historical links going back such a long period of time. And I found that a very interesting and exciting experience because there are many young people in the Bangladeshi community in the, in the East End of London who are really hungry for ideas and, and new ways of thinking. And this is one enterprise which gives them that. The reason I started this project is because I did my dissertation in war history. So I wanted to, before I did my master's, I wanted to see what other parts of history I'm interested in. And so I thought this project came up and I thought, great opportunity. But I focused on the war side of it. Guess I just love war history. It was the chance to use uh, primary sources and records and, um, and root around in those to find some stories that really attracted me to this. I was very, very pleased to be a part of the project with Brick Lane from the beginning, the Human Stories and the East India Company project. Um, the VNA is always looking for opportunities to connect with communities around London, um, especially communities that might share a heritage with our collections. The India Office records are public records, so I've always really been keen that they should be really accessible to everybody. But what the stories is doing is giving people the opportunity to research, to find out the complexities, to come up, you know, make their own decisions about what they feel was the East India Company was involved in, to see the many, many conflicts and battles with, amongst people who are involved and to try and understand how it has contributed towards the world that we live in today. I think some people can perhaps be a bit intimidated by writing a factual article and um, feel that they've got to be really, really careful to get absolutely everything right. And I think when writing fiction, people will still want to try and get things right. But they've got the comfort of knowing that they can always use a bit of poetic license if they've got any gaps to fill or that sort of thing. And it's an opportunity to use your imagination as well, which I think is a good way of getting people to think more deeply. The East India Company is hugely historically significant in being the first joint stock company. It is the seed of many of the current day corporations. I always love the story of their first arrival in the Indian Ocean as one of a tiny band of European traders sailing up to the coast of a vast nation of people, untold wealth and beauty, and the, the sheer ambition of, of their moving forward from there and what they built out of it. The East India Company began as a commercial enterprise. It was set up by a bunch of traders, um, but it found itself in the peculiar position that it was able to exploit divisions inside India, particularly in Bengal, and by exploiting divisions within the ruling elites. From be being a trading company, it very rapidly became a ruling company and de facto the ruler of Bengal by playing off different interests in the country against each other. So it's a very unique example of how economic power gets converted into political power and state power. I think it's fair to say that when the East India Company was set up in 1600, it really set in process those deep connections between South Asia and Britain that have helped to make us such a diverse culture. What I would say about the East India Company, it was tremendously important to British history, to um, Britain becoming the power that it is today and yet surprisingly it's not really the centre of the British history curriculum and many many people growing up in Britain will have no idea that it ever existed. I think it's an important part of history that we don't look at particularly within schools. It lays the groundwork for a lot of what's going to come later. There would have been no Raj without the East India Company. Um, and therefore, um, 
I think that to look at this story of um, these traders and what they were doing is, is fascinating, but also salutary. Mirmadan dies before noon from British cannon fire. Heavy rain starts to pour in on the battleground about midday and damages the Bengal forces' gunpowders. Siraj Udala seeks advice from Mir Jafar and Ray Durlab, who wrongly suggest that the Bengal forces retreat and then organize a counterattack. Mohan Lala reluctantly retreats as a result of Siraj Udala's order. The British attack the retreating army. So I'd never really written any short story, didn't really know much about doing research and history. So this is a new experience for me. Um, and it was a bit of a slog as well because I was thinking, where am I going to get the information? So I, you know, I had to go to the British Library. I'd managed to find quite a few books which were uh, not in print, difficult to get hold of. I was learning as I went along, but then I also liked that there was a good group of people in the project as well. One of the key people that was there to guide us was Anadola, who was the inspiration of the project. And he, he's, he was and always has been a good, good uh, mentor. Well, we started off by being taken to various places. So we went to the Clothmakers Hall and we looked at textiles. We uh, had some, some people from the V&A show us artifacts and furniture. Um, and that was really interesting because I knew by then I'd already seen 1620. I knew I was looking for the very early stage. So when we were looking at the types of, of textiles that would have been, or the types of objects that there would have been at that point, um, I was looking for examples that I could bring into the story and use within the story. The aspects of the East India Company that are most fascinating are those that reflect the manufacturing practices of India and Bangladesh and Pakistan um, in the mid-19th century, just when we're seeing this shift into industrial manufacturing really, really take foothold and change the way that we live today. Um, so the things that I think about when I'm considering that are hand-woven handkerchiefs and hand-tied bandanas and um, hand-embroidered collars, things that are beautiful and stunning work um, and reflect a kind of level of skill and knowledge um, and, and heritage that has since been lost to different methods of manufacturing. The, when we were asked to write the story, it was very difficult because uh, we were so much involved in research. We were so much involved in knowing East India Company and what happened and the people's views and knowing people. But when it comes to creative writing, it's that you have to do the actions. So we, most of us, we find it very difficult, but we had a very great uh, tutors who helped us through, Rajiv helped us through the writing course. So we started this project two years ago, and we started by taking walks and um, visiting museums, which is really cool, um, because who doesn't love museums? And then after that, um, we had to pick a topic. The one that I was most familiar with was the Battle of Plassey. So I decided to go with that. And I love villains. <laughs> villains is something I'm really interested in, just because I want to understand their mindset. So I decided to write about Mira Jafar. When I do the walks, Everybody has got something to offer. People usually come on the walks because they have some sort of area of interest. They have bits and pieces to offer. So um, I think everybody is amazed at how much uh, evidence there is in this part of London, of sort of physical material evidence that, that links here with the East End Indies. And so I'm just talking about the physical structure of the docks. They're very surprised when they see the walls of the docks because they might have walked past them many, many times. The Tower Hamlets council chambers are within the, those walls, but they have never ever thought, what were those walls for? The story I picked up during my research is one of the female character, um, which one of the uh, Jamindar, it's only female Jamindar, which 
caught my eyes in when, when I was doing the research. And the story is all about her and her daughter, but about the Nawab of Bengal and the East India Company as well. So the story is about uh, Jack, who is a um, young lad who has escaped from London, um, <coughs> running away from his mum that was getting beaten up by his dad. And he's escaped to a uh, part of Bridport, which is on the coast. And he's been helped and mentored by um, his employer. So my story is about the early life of Mirajafar and I didn't want to portray him as like a good guy because he is a villain. He's like the biggest portrayer in Bengali history. So um, when I started writing about Mirajafar, I thought I didn't want to write from his perspective. This paragraph is about Hiranya and her daughter Elakshi and this will give a reflections of their personality. Adopting Elakshi had significantly changed her life. Notwithstanding being a widow, at a such a young age, in the man's world of Jamindari, she had never felt that loneliness was unbearable. Her focus on Elakshi and her Zamindari had made her a stronger and more content person, and she often has been referred to as lady with a great political sagacity as well as an affectionate mother. Under her strict training regime, Elakshis had developed skills in sword fighting and horse riding at a young age. Long ago, Hiranya had noticed the hidden talent in Elakshi and secretly desired to shape those talent and make her a lady with exquisite beauty and brain and bravery the commander-in-chief of her army. The queen, like many East Indian was built out of timber and rigged with hemp sails and rope. She was pierced for 50 guns and ranked with 50-gun frigates, to which she bore a very close resemblance and was more than capable of being converted in a moment to a warship. Victoria gazed in awe at the ship and her beautiful sails. Those sails look very familiar. Of course they look familiar. When she was brought to England, she was fitted out with sailcloth and rope at Britport, Jack said. You mean to say that the hemp fibre that we spent so many hours every day making into rope and sails were fitted onto these ships? I mean, especially being from East London, being Asian, I feel like I don't know enough, and we don't know enough about our background and our history, especially because being a British Muslim Bengali, there's a link, and to, um, I think the East India Company is a very important project because it allows us to go back beyond our grandparents who came here and find out how Britain and India first met and the first relationships and how it all started and how we ended up here.